Good afternoon. I'm Seth Jones. I'm the Senior Vice President and Director of the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. On behalf of CSIS and the U.S. Naval Institute, we're proud to bring you the next event of our Maritime Security Dialogue series. The series is made possible through the generous support uh, and the sponsorship of HII. The U.S. Pacific Fleet, uh, 7th Fleet, is the U.S. Navy's largest forward deployed numbered fleet. For more than 75 years, the 7th Fleet has maintained a continuous forward presence in the Indo-Pacific, providing security and stability in the region. And we're excited to have Vice Admiral Carl Thomas, commander of the U.S. 7th Fleet, to the Maritime Security Dialogue Series, and we're particularly delighted to be hosting him at the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center at the U.S. Naval Institute on the grounds of the U.S. Naval Academy. Vice Admiral Thomas took command in July of last year. He's a native of Northern Virginia and received his commission through the Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps at RPI in 1986. He was formerly a carrier a aviator in the E-2C Hawkeye. He has commanded Carrier Airborne Early Warning Squadron 117, the US, USS Mount Whitney, the USS Abraham Lincoln, and the USS Carl Vinson, in addition to a long and distinguished career. And thanks, thank, thanks to you very much, uh, uh, Vice Admiral Thomas, for joining us today. Uh, now I will hand the floor over to Vice Admiral Pete Daly, Chief Executive Officer and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute and the lead for this discussion. So over to you, Pete, and thanks for the cooperation. Thank you, Seth. So we really, uh, we're in our sixth or seventh year of this uh, tremendous partnership between uh, CSIS and uh, Naval Institute, and we truly appreciate it. Um, well, we're very thrilled to have the uh, Seventh Fleet Commander here, and um, there's a lot going on. And there was some early Vegas odds that maybe you wouldn't be allowed to, to travel. But uh, glad to see that the chain of command is comfortable enough in its own skin to, to send you here. This is, there were times in my recollection where maybe that wouldn't have happened. So that's a good sign. Um, so with uh, the rollout of the national defense strategy earlier this year, and uh, of course, we didn't really get, we just got a couple unclassed pages on that. But then uh, this week, we had the national security strategy roll out, and we did get a redacted, unclassified version of that. And both those documents really doubled down on the whole idea that China is the pacing threat. And that, that really, in, in a phrase, puts, puts you on the point. And so we're thrilled to have you, and uh, we'll get right into it. Um, the first uh, question I wanted to ask you, Admiral, was the tempo in the Seventh Fleet's been high in 2022. And, and for starters, can you describe the type of operations you're conducting, the nature of the ops in the South China Sea, the East China Sea? How do they contribute to maritime security? And what behavior and trends you're seeing uh, with the PRC and the Russians. Yeah, sure, Pete. And uh, just for those that don't know, uh, it's good to see uh, Pete Daly. He was my strike group commander when I was a squadron CEO of the VW 117 wall bangers way back when on the Nimitz strike group. And so uh, it's funny that uh, he was there the day that I found out that I got the nuclear power program. And, uh, and to, to be sitting in this seat uh, with you today, it's an honor first, and then to have the privilege to be able to lead the Seventh Fleet is a tremendous honor, and there's a large number of men and women that serve your country uh, every day. I think it's kind of fitting that yesterday was the 247th birthday, and the theme of our birthday was 24-7, a moniker for standing the watch 24-7, and that's really what the Seventh Fleet team does every day to protect not only the United States, but all of our allies and partners in the region. I think to start off and explain uh, how we approach what is, quite frankly, a very challenging theater. I'll just quickly run down what we're doing today and give you a, an opportunity to understand the way that we integrate with our allies and partners and describe some of the operations that we're doing. And we've, you know, the national security strategy did come out uh, yesterday. 
And it's got a very good uh, page in there that talks about integrated deterrence and how we stitch together all of our deterrent actions across not only the, the dime, uh, diplomacy, information, military, and economic, but uh, via regions and across domains. And so as I describe the operations that we're conducting, I think you're going to see that play out uh, loudly. So I'll, I'll go north to south just so it's easy to kind of flow down through the 7th Fleet AOR, which is rather large. Uh, we're finishing up Resolute Dragon, which is an exercise up in Hokkaido, Japan, with a 3MEF. We've got a very tight linkage with our Marine Corps brethren. And uh, they were working with the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force, Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, and we had the binfold up there uh, conducting a fires exercise in Hokkaido. Uh, at the same time, we have a mine exercise going on in the Sea of Japan with, or the East Sea, if, uh, if you use South Korean parlance. Uh, but we're doing a mine countermeasure exercise there with Great Britain and South Koreans. Um, a little farther south, I've got the Tripoli pulling into Okinawa doing some expeditionary work uh, off of Okinawa as part of Common Dog that was happening up in uh, northern Luzon. Uh, I've got Mount Rushmore and, and the New Orleans, who's in Subic Bay, old stomping grounds from when I was a young J.O., uh, backloading coming out of that Common Dog exercise. So again, a very, and actually this year in Common Dog, we had Japanese and South Korean ground forces that were participating with the Philippines. And today, the uh, Ronald Reagan pulled into Manila. Uh, so uh, a lot of Philippine action I actually flew here from Cebu, uh, the Philippines, uh, kicked off the Sama Sama Lumbus exercise, which is a maritime security exercise uh, where we've combined Sama Sama, which is an exercise that we do, with the Lumbus exercise, which is an uh, exercise that Australia does with the Philippines. And we've combined it into one large multilateral exercise, and it has Japan. Uh, Canada, Great Britain, uh, Australia, and so very, you know, what you're, the theme you should be picking up is that everything we do, we try to do with our allies and partners, and we try to show solidarity, we try to work together to improve our interoperability, to learn from one another. I just came from Kakadu not too long ago, down in Australia, in Darwin, where we had uh, 20 fleet leaders come together in a round table and discuss maritime concerns, not only in our neck of the woods, but also down into the Oceania area. So to be able to hear from the leaders of Tonga and Papua New Guinea and the Solomons and you know, just a, a large effort across the fleet right now uh, to show a united front for the rules-based international order uh, and to uh, tell those that maybe have different ideas that, that uh, you know, we're, we're common in the way we think about the importance of maritime security for that region. and you know. 70 plus years, the Seven Fleet's been out there ensuring the maritime security for the prosperity of all. And it's worked pretty well, and we want to continue that same theme. You asked about Russia and China and the activity that we're seeing. Uh, you know, I've got the, the fortune of having been the strike group commander out there, came back to the Pentagon during a period called COVID, and then came back to the Seventh Fleet. And it gives me an opportunity to kind of be able to compare and contrast and to be able to explain the behavior that I've seen of the PRC in that time frame. And I would tell you when I was a strike group commander, uh, I think everybody in this room and this audience is smart enough to understand uh, the PRC excessive claims of the nine dash line and basically the entirety of the South China Sea. Uh, when I was a strike group commander, I, I pulled the last carrier probably ever into Hong Kong. I got the Ronald Reagan strike group into Hong Kong and I'm unfortunate, uh, you know, been there many times in my Navy career and unfortunately it may be, have been my last time. Uh, but we would have the PRC uh, join us if we were operating in the South China Sea. Uh, if we left the nine dash line, they would break off. Today, they are a little more persistent. They'll, they'll stay with us a little farther. Uh, they patrol the Spratleys a little greater than they did back then. Uh, they do more coordinated exercises, but you know they do it often by themselves. And as I articulated earlier, uh, when we do an exercise, it's with all of our friends. Uh, the Russian activity, uh, clearly we pay attention to the Pacific uh, Northern Fleet from Russia, and we see them operate out of Vladivostok and out of Petr, and, uh, and we watch them closely. And we see some activity where there might, what I would call coordinated activity between uh, the PRC and Russia, uh, but I wouldn't call it necessarily integrated activity and not the type of planning that's done uh, by our forces to generate an exercise that's meaningful and then certainly not as transparently as, as what we do with our allies and partners. You know, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the prosperity for all, 
And it always strikes me that one of the biggest uh, beneficiaries of that was the PRC themselves, the yeah, Pax Americana in the Western Pacific. Yeah, there's a great, great uh, paragraph in the National Security Strategy that kind of compares and contrasts, and it says that very thing, where it, uh, they're the biggest beneficiaries of the, of the prosperity and the open society that we have, yet at the same time, they, they try to turn it into their own uh, closed benefit and their own authoritarian uh, benefits, so it's, a, it's an oxymoron. Well, I was gonna also ask you, uh, I was gonna ask you about partnerships, but I think you really hit that already and the importance of the partnerships and uh, the rules-based international order. What does the PRC reaction after Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, um, was there anything there that surprised you in the nature and types of operations that we observed from the PRC after that? Yeah, I've been asked that question uh, a fair number of times and, and the adjective I usually apply to it as irresponsible. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we have a responsibility through the Taiwan Relations Act to uh, provide uh, defensive capability to, to Taiwan and to make sure that we're ready and we are uh, to, to uh, we, our desire would be to uh, have peaceful resolution of cross-strait differences. Uh, the PRC says that that's their desire, but, you know, when you see them fire uh, ballistic missiles over Taiwan and, and have them land in the maritime commons and into shipping lanes, and uh, some of them actually landed in the Japanese economic exclusion zone. Uh, that's, that's why I attach that word, uh, irresponsible. Um, I think that that's, that's not the way that countries that want to be leaders within the world should, should behave. And especially, you know, our, our legislatures, if uh, it's in our, our law that we're going to provide for the, the defense of, of Taiwan and, and help them with their defenses, it, it, it's what democracies do. We go and we communicate, we see what, what those uh, individuals need and, and have dialogue and then to, to get that reaction I thought was a little bit overreaching. Okay. Well, um, we're several years on from the uh, USS Fitzgerald and the USS McCain uh, collisions. And uh, I wanted to ask you, um, do you feel like we've achieved the right balance between training, maintenance, and operations out there, or is there more to do? And uh, we've also made organizational changes like uh, standing up a uh, surface group in uh, the Western Pacific there in Yoko, as you well know. But um, And another area of special interest that feeds into this readiness kind of question is the manning. I mean, that got a lot of attention. And do you think that the, uh, the fit and fill uh, that you're getting out there for the uh, four deployed naval forces in Japan is uh, supporting you? Yeah, obviously we, we run our forces hard. There's no doubt about it that we uh, have a lot of these operations, these activities, investments to do with our forces. And so we pay an awful lot of attention to it. And clearly the comprehensive review, uh, the SRR both found uh, several things that were were lacking, and, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll break it out by man and train and equip. So manning, uh, I'm very fortunate in four deployed naval forces that our manning levels are higher than what they are in the continental United States. Uh, typically, we're a 93, 95% fit and fill, and uh, we try to man our crews out there to 100%. Doesn't mean that we have periods of time where we're, we have a gap, and so we address the manning of every ship and look at it and, and work with the Bureau to to fill uh, and find the right individuals and the qualified and skilled individuals. From a training perspective, uh, back before those accidents, a little over five years ago, uh, there was, uh, we would waive certifications if we couldn't get them accomplished. And, uh, and I'll, I'm very proud to say that there's about a 0% chance of any kind of waiver when it comes to training certification. And Admiral Aquilino has held that line when he was packed fleet. Admiral Papar has carried that. and uh, and. It's not even really a consideration quite So even to the point of tying up a, a major ship that might be needed for operations, that's a, everybody's on there. Yeah, well, the way we approach online. it is if we think there's a, 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 a possibility the ship may not be able to make it, we try to find what's our backup plan, what's our tertiary plan, and what ship are we going to use. And, and even to a greater point, we don't bring them into the first island chain if we don't think that they're at the right level of training. 
uh, because of the activity of the PRC. We, we take a look at every ship and the mission that they have to do. I think the biggest thing when it comes to the accidents in 2015 and 16, the surface force has done a tremendous job in the training pipeline and the simulators that they uh, have up at SWAS and the, the rigid curriculum and the fact that not only the JOs but the department heads, the XOCO, when they're coming back to command, they have to actually pass a simulator and a check ride and it has teeth to it and some folks aren't able to become a department head and so the, the rigor that's been put into the program is good, it makes better ship drivers and certainly we learned a lot about watch bills and I think the, you know, an equipment maintenance, we're ensuring that we're giving them the time they need to get the maintenance done on the ship. Uh, but, but the reality is that the folks like Comnav Surf Crew Westpac, Joel Lang just took over that. He was the CEO of the Tripoli, and I had a chance to meet him when I went out on the Tripoli. Uh, he's a really sharp officer, and he and the SWO boss, he is the SWO boss's forward eyes and ears. And uh, the team really works well together to make sure that we're not cutting any corners, that ships are prepared. And I feel like we're in a good spot, but never complacent to the point that even in yesterday's three-star, four-star discussion, uh, we were talking about uh, get real, get better. Uh, we were talking about the Learning uh, Action Board, and one of the things that we're going to do with the Learning Action Board is to go back and revisit the comprehensive review and the SR and make sure five years later, wherever, however much time since we implemented these changes, that uh, they still are applicable, there's not something else that we're missing, and that the things we put in place are still working. So uh, a continuous learning culture, which I think is healthy. Well, we've just, uh, gosh, in the last uh, month or so, there was a, uh, the annual you know, maintenance conference. Um, I think it was down in Norfolk, and uh, NAVC was there, the regional maintenance guys were there, and they painted a pretty grim picture of the ability to keep up I mean, it's uh, really, if you look back almost 20 years, you know, since the, the height of uh, OIF, you know, the Navy never really got the dedicated reset that, uh, you know, some people felt was needed. And uh, we've always seemed like we're just five years away from catching up on maintenance. And, um, and so are you satisfied with the the ability to turn ships out there. I mean, it's one thing to hold the line and say, okay, we've got the balance right between ops, maintenance, and training. But are the different entities that are supporting you for this, are they able to do it? There's been some pretty, you know, well-advertised uh, situations out there where ships are waiting a long time. And it strikes me that you're under a lot of pressure to, to churn them out. So is the forward maintenance establishment getting it done for you out there? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually in a very good position from our SRF facility out there. The Japanese uh, workers that work in Yokosuka uh, and the ones in Sasebo, uh, they are a different workforce, and it's an ethic, it's a culture. Uh, so in that regard, when you put a ship into work and you're doing basic work like tank work, or hull work, it's, uh, it's, it's very good. Uh, when you get to uh, C5I capability, we often have to bring in contractors to get some of that work done. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, we are, are working hard, uh, with our, our ships are working hard, and they require maintenance. Um, some of the, yeah, I I'm, I'm definitely have my challenges with a ship that uh, will have something go wrong with it, and I'll have to bring it in. Uh, I've got the Barry, uh, conducting some work on pumps right now that we didn't expect to, uh, to break and gas turbine motors break. And, and so we, we find ourselves having to adapt. And so what that requires is it requires that team I talk about, whether it's my Desron commander, my SRF uh, shipyard commander, or the Comnast Surf Crew Westpac, or my staff uh, working together to look downrange and say, okay, this ship really needs this maintenance. What's our alternative? And so uh, it's a dynamic situation, it's a day-to-day -day situation, uh, but for the planned periods, uh, the SIAs and the SRAs were sticking to those periods. And do you feel like, um, it seems to me that there's still a little bit of an air gap there in the C2, because you're obviously numerical fleet commander, numbered fleet commander, you've got the operational chain, soup to nuts. But, you know, here you have some entities out there like type commander entities like Surf Group Westpac. Do you feel like those dotted lines are working? I do. I, th I think that, uh, you know, 
when we stood up Comnav Surf Crew SPAC, the theory was the operational commander had too much responsibility, and they were the ones that were able to cut corners because we had to make all these operations. And so the, the answer to that was we need to stand up this organization that will be able to, to be the type commander, to be the honest broker, right. and to ensure that we don't do that. So that was the theory behind Comnav Surf Crew SPAC. Uh, what I would tell you is that over our time and our experience of working this organization and working the team out there, it really is a team effort. And it's no one entity can uh, manage uh, the, the maintenance effort there. It has to be a team sport and, and a balance because there is uh, such a heavy load on our ships. And so, uh, but any one member of the team can, can say, hey, hold on, time out, we need, to, uh, we need to take a pause here. And then when it comes down to it, at the end, it's my responsibility to make, make sure that we're deploying safe ships, prepared ships, and, uh, and I'm not going to cut that corner. No, it's, I think, it's, uh, I think it, the truth has really revealed itself that if, to do that is uh, the path to the wrong end. But you mentioned the team, and so you've got this team that's like your home team, the FDNF ships that are there in Japan, the 20 some ships. And then you've got folks that are deploying into your AOR, uh, mostly from the West Coast and Hawaii, obviously a little bit of Everett and Bremerton. And uh, so do you find these are two different entities? Uh, one is worked up under the standard, you know, East West Coast workup plan. And then you guys have that slightly different workup plan. Um, as far as team goes, do you feel like the assets that you're getting in theater are uh, assimilating quickly and ready? And have you been pleased with their readiness and uh, capabilities to arrive, um, you know, ready to work? Yeah, I think that you know, Strike Group 15 is the uh, entity that's responsible for working up the strike groups on the West Coast, and uh, they've done a really nice job. I get a chance to to brief with the strike group that's working up, and they provide me. Uh, you know, they have a, a very good curriculum that talks to different theaters and different levels of, of preparedness, and they brief me and it gives me a chance to, to talk with the strike group before they ever come out. Right now we've got the Nimitz strike group doing their uh, Comp 2 exercise. And so we, uh, we do a very good job of folding the two teams together. Um, I think that the, the way we get to the end state uh, in FDNF, because we are operating at a higher op tempo and tend to be out there in contact routinely. Our, our bathtub never quite gets quite as deep um, and the readiness level stays up. They get an opportunity to, to uh, do LVC training and to really expand their maneuver and their distributed maritime ops on the west coast. And so they, through Comp2X and Red Forces, they, they peak uh, maybe a little bit higher and then as they come out, their readiness might fall, and so we end up being in about the same spot, and uh, mm -hmm. we have opportunities routinely to, to bring our two strike groups together or to bring our amphibs and our strike groups together, and, and to be truthful, when it, you know, the way I view it in a very simple term, it's shoot, move, and communicate, distributed maritime ops, and then the fires aspect of find, fix, track, target, engage, and assess, and those are the muscle movements that we need to be able to be totally interoperable on. And we practice that every time that the forces are out there. You know, you just mentioned uh, distributed maritime ops. Um, you know, it's been a lot of talk about that. And I was wondering if you, it's, it's difficult even for me to fully comprehend what the change is. I mean, part of it I could see with the, uh, you know, the disaggregated, aggregated concepts that we've applied in the past. You know, there was a time when we did away with the, the, the picture of the strike group because everybody who looked at the picture thought we all operated that way all <laughs> together. And, uh, and clearly we haven't. So if we have been doing the disaggregated for some time, what's the new change? What's the delta with DMO? Just maybe a couple examples. Yeah, so I would say that uh, the picture is always important. Got to have the picture to let you know that you've done the exercise. But you're right. We're not going to aggregate. We're not going to aggregate. We're not going to be in that, that tight of formation. But really what distributed maritime ops is about is being able to bring fires from multiple axes uh, at a point in time of our choosing and mass them to create the effect that we want. And so we'll often, uh, you know, part of this is with our Marine Corps brethren. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, of the Commandant's uh, force design. Uh, we've gotten to the point now where we've taken my CTF-76 
and the third MEB, and we've combined, we've actually integrated the two staffs. And uh, my, my good friend Chip Beerman, who's uh, General Beerman, 3MF, he and I uh, conduct staff talks and rock drills, and uh, that inside force and being able to integrate what they can bring uh, to the table with what the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force can bring, what the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force can bring, what my naval forces can bring, what the Air Force can bring, and do it at the time and place in an integrated manner using different sensing techniques, which I won't go into in great depth, but to be able to sense, to find, to hold targeting uh, capability, and then to deliver the weapons from various axes. That's, in a nutshell, distributed maritime ops. Being distributed is such you're less vulnerable because you aren't aggregated. You talked about the uh, integration of the staffs um, at the lower level. And it's a great example, I think, of what's new is old and what's old is new. Because if you look at how Nimitz ran the Pacific War, he was very big on that integrated staff option, not the GHQ, um, kind of the Army model, but the early lower level integration coordination model. And so um, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how that works out. It seems to me like it's very logically done between at least the Navy and the Marines. And uh, yeah, we, I've, we've never been tighter in my, in my career than we are yeah. right now. Well, it's great to see. And uh, General Berger's thinking on this is, uh, I think, really changing things. Yeah. You mentioned earlier, um, Admiral, the, uh, you know, uh, Captain Joel Lang, who uh, commanded Tripoli and did that, uh, you know, what some people call the lightning carrier test. But he, uh, you know, zorched across the Pacific, picked up all those uh, F-35Bs in Iwakuni. I think it was like some 20 F-35. It was 14 in Iwakuni. It was 20 off of San Diego. And so uh, how did that, I know they're, they've gone back to the configuration now. Um, you know, the standard arc U with 31st Mu configuration. But for the the time period that experiment that you know two three months out there how did that go and is there any insights you could share from that did that when you saw that and the operations with a standard carrier group how did that work yeah so it's a it's a neat capability you know joel uh, likes to call it the assault carrier instead of the lightning carrier which i think is and what, the reason he does that is he says it's just got such you know, one day you can have F-35Bs on the flight deck, the next day you could have MV-22s, and you can be putting Marines ashore. And so it just is a very versatile instrument. And the fact that you have 14 fifth gen uh, fighters on board, it's an incredibly, uh, incredibly capable sensor. Uh, and so we're still in the experimentation phase. We wanted to uh, really try to find out how would you integrate an assault carrier with a full-size carrier, what missions might it be able to do. And what we found is when we operated it this, uh, this last summer, uh, one, I embarked my staff so we could check out the C2 capability of an LHA and see what op options we had there. Uh, but then we also, um, you know, we had two of our aircraft carriers with the Tripoli conducting the Valiant Shield exercise. Right. And I think you embarked for I did. I embarked that with a, on a small portion on, with my staff on AAA. And so what we, uh, what we found is uh, we, we distributed our three large decks for a period of time. Uh, and I will note that uh, LHA with 14 F-35Bs is much more capable than either of the PRC's current carriers, uh, both from a sortie uh, creation perspective as well as just a, a sheer capability. Uh, there is no comparison between a J-15 and a F-35 Bravo. Uh, but it, uh, there's mission sets that I think that it'll be designed for. I think that there's regions that it could operate in a better capacity. Mm -hmm. And then I think it, it, because of the vertical takeoff nature of the F-35s, you can find yourself putting F-35s in AEBOs, and maybe you bring them back out to the ship for some maintenance and you move them elsewhere. Um, maybe you lash them up with the carrier and use the, uh, the command and control or the count, you know, electronic countermeasure capability of the E-2s and the growlers. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're still, still in experiment phase, um, but uh, a capability that you know, we've seen Queen Elizabeth come across and have F-35Bs on her flight deck. We know that Japan uh, 
has uh, launched an F-35B off of Azumo. So it also allows our allies and partners to see the, the, uh, the capability you can bring with, with F-35Bs on the flat top. No, thank you. Um, so Presidis has been writing a number of articles under this uh, moniker of a maritime counterinsurgency project. And uh, we started that in July. And kind of the, the premise of it is that it's not sufficient just to prepare for the high-end fight. You've got to prepare for the high-end fight. But also, we need to be able to counter the PLA Navy, the China Coast Guard, the People's Armed Forces Maritime Militia, and even down to the state-owned fishing fleet uh, when they're violating international norms, and you mentioned rules-based international order earlier, and exerting Chinese claims in other nations' um, EEZs. And so you mentioned also General Berger that he was at, he did one of these um, maritime security dialogues about a year and a half ago, and he mentioned, uh, he said, if deterrence is working, then why did we watch the Chinese build the runway that they said they wouldn't build, build the revetments, the reinforced uh, hangars, and the radars, and install the missiles on these islands in the South China Sea? What was it? What was the shortcoming of deterrence? And then you started off by saying, hey, NSS, integrated deterrence. That's a key component of both the NSS and the uh, national defense strategy. So do you see this integrated deterrence as answering uh, what many perceived as a gap in the gray zone, the fact that others can take advantage of us because they know we're going to follow the rules? Any, any thoughts on that? I mean, th something's got to change. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think as you look back, you mentioned the South China Sea uh, island buildup. I think that that speaks volumes to, you know, Chairman Xi told uh, the president at the time that they wouldn't do that, and they clearly did. So that, uh, you know, I think we as a nation wanted to believe that uh, the PRC, because of their global economy and getting brought into the fold of the way that the, the Western economies work, that that would change them. It clearly didn't. Um, to the gray zone, uh, you know, clearly they have, uh, as an authoritarian regime, the ability to use state-owned fishing, to use uh, PAFM uh, militia, and it, it's uh, an area that we see them them doing. And so, uh, integrated de deterrence, I think, is the answer. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, opportunities to share information with our allies and partners, and we do uh, share information with them. Uh, clearly, their Coast Guards, the Japanese Coast Guard, is very capable and very large, and that it's an area that they uh, very very aggressively uh, work on. Uh, the Philippine Coast Guard, not as large. Uh, we have our Coast Guard come out and work with their Coast Guards, and I think that's been uh, very beneficial to uh, the U.S. Coast Guard has really stepped up and brought their cutters over there, and we just had the midget leave. And so that is that is an aspect of it, is the training and the uh, working with, with like uh, capabilities. But when it comes to uh, exposing the malign behavior, the, the false claims, uh, you have to do that in the information space. You have to do that through diplomatic channels. You have to do that uh, through military. I don't actually have that much interaction with them. They tend to to uh, swarm into areas that are either close into some of those features, but we don't really have that many interactions out in the, the broader South China Sea or East China Sea. Um, but if in the integrated deterrence uh, scheme where you're looking across domains, you're looking across instruments of power, regions, clearly illegal fishing down in the Oceania region is a huge thing for those countries. And so it has to be a multinational, multi-domain effort to expose this behavior. And then the national, international community has to be willing to step up and work on it together. It's, it's a little bit of what we've seen in the Ukraine-Russia conflict, that when, when you violate sovereignty, when you don't follow rules-based international order, the international community will step up. The challenge with the PRC is they stay right below that level, and they just incrementally uh, work it. And so it's very important that we don't accept, and that's why we do freedom of navigation operations, 
If we didn't do them and we just accepted the claims, uh, the claims that are beyond what the United Nations Convention Law on the Sea allows, the claims that have been determined uh, not legal in the International Tribunal, uh, if we don't do those freedom of navigation ops, we don't have our like-minded nations, and fortunately we've seen Australia and Canada sail through the Taiwan Straits routinely. Uh, routinely might be a strong word, but uh, we've seen them sail through there, and we do it regularly. If you don't, if you don't push back, and if you don't, uh, you know, take a stand, then they'll just continue to move the ball down the field, and, and you know, enough's enough. With the tension that's inherent in this. Um, you know, there's the code for unplanned encounters at sea, queues, um, the kind of, I always think of it as like the ink sea of mm -hmm. uh, the Western Pacific, the uh, agreements that we had in the Cold War with the Russian Navy to de-escalate and uh, when things got tough. Are, is that being used out there? It is. Uh, you know, all of my ships, all of my air crew uh, have the queues at their disposal. Um, they will use it. The queues is a product of uh, one of the WPNS uh, symposiums that was that happened. I think I think it was 2014. Um, we have one of those coming up in Tokyo when the nations come together and try to come up with these these measures to be able to provide for maritime security. And uh, so we have it and we use it. I will tell you that uh, the PRC usually, if they if they don't respond, I know, I know they understand what we're saying. And I also tell tell my ship commanders and you know squadron commanders if if you need to get your intentions across, use plain voice if necessary. But uh, in general, um, not a lot of dialogue with it, but certainly many nations have signed up for it. And uh, you know, the, the bottom line is it's out there to remove ambiguity and to try to let the other guy know what your intentions are uh, so that we can decompress the situation. Thanks. I just want to take a second here. I'm going to ask one or two more questions and then open it up to audience questions. We have mics up front. The only thing we require is that you ask a question and identify yourselves And when you ask a question. And uh, we also have people uh, watching online who will be able to submit questions and we'll pass those on to the Admiral. Um, so we'll be doing that in just a moment. But uh, you know, we haven't talked about the Koreans so much and uh, North Koreans and uh, you know, the Navy has been making some pretty strong noises lately that like, hey, MBMD, you know, we're going to do some of it, but if it can be done from land, uh, maybe that's somebody else's responsibility. And of course, the Navy's under immense pressure from a budget standpoint. Um, you're on point. The Navy is in an inherently maritime region out there with this uh, Chinese threat. Um, so we've got the North Koreans firing missiles over Japan at certain points in the last few weeks. Um, where do you see the maritime ballistic missile defense thing balancing out? Do you think we're going to do less from sea, more from sea? It seems to me that it's got to be a huge part of one of your mandates, which is to reassure our Japanese allies. Yeah, so, um very fortunate to have several ships that have ballistic missile capability. Clearly, there's ballistic missile capability to protect our allies and partners. Uh, we just did a, a trilateral ballistic missile defense exercise following the most recent shots from uh, Korea to let them know that uh, we're lockstep and unified in our uh, defense of, our, of those allies, South Korea and Japan. Uh, I certainly have ships that uh, have the capability to defend the land mass. I would tell you that all my ships are multi-mission uh, ships, and there's uh, capability like a THAAD battery that could defend against a geographic uh, location. Uh, I think that there's uh, certainly Japan itself is looking at its own ballistic missile defenses, but I'll also tell you the PRC has ballistic missiles, uh, DF-21s and 26s and YJ-20s that they can launch out of their Renhais and their Luyang 3s. So, Having the ballistic missile defense is not only uh, to protect our allies and partners, it's to protect ourselves, and our ships are extremely capable. And so having that uh, ballistic missile defense capability is something that I would want on every one of my crew dose ships, just from a, a multi-domain uh, capability. Uh, but uh, certainly in competition and the, the 
spectrum of conflict where we live right now and competition, uh, it is a, a very good reassurance to both Japan and South Korea. The, um, you just touched on the Ukraine briefly, but uh, is there anything that you see in the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict that informs or gives you an insight about your theater? I know there are tremendous differences, but there may be a few things that, and maybe you already touched on one, which is will, to have the will, the, you know, to do the right thing. But um, any comment on that? You know, from you must be watching it very closely um, for implications in the Western Pacific. Yeah, I think uh, I think the first thing I would hope that the PRC would be watching is that when you try to, to you know use force to uh, go across borders, um, that it causes the international community to uh, to respond as a team. And I think there's 50 plus nations that are. The Secretary of Defense is working with right now to provide uh, support to Ukraine. Uh, clearly, it's a it's a different geography when you if you try to draw parallels between Ukraine and Taiwan. Um, but I think we've learned quite a bit in the world of asymmetric uh, weaponry. I think uh, when you look at uh, an ability to hide and uh, operate uh, in Ukraine or in you know. Uh, with foxholes or with camouflage, clearly that, that doesn't exist as you're trying to cross 80 plus miles of, of water. Um, I think that uh, we haven't seen an amphibious landing for a very long time for a reason. Uh, when you're working against precision munitions, it's a different, uh, a different animal. And so, uh, you know, I would say the will of the, of the Ukrainian people and the leadership of Ukraine is another thing that uh, I think all of us are watching and, and are very uh, impressed with. President Zelensky and the way that he's he's led his country, and I think that as you uh, you look at that importance of, of those people and their determination to defend their nation, that's something that you could uh, take away and apply. And then I think that you look at um, the challenges that Russia has has had in this fight to be able to not only sustain themselves, but to you know it, it certainly didn't play out the way that they thought. And I think that the decision. Uh, with all that we know now, eight months later, if uh, President Putin had that uh, decision to make again, I, I doubt that he'd make that decision. So I would hope that uh, Chairman Xi is looking at that and uh, maybe taking some lessons as well. But I think the biggest lesson, I would hope, is that you look at the will of the people of the United States, the will of the free world, the will of like-minded nations to come together uh, to support that nation uh, when they were illegally invaded, and uh, that's, that's the biggest lesson I would hope that anybody would take out of it. Thank you. Uh, microphones are open. I'm going to take a question, question from the audience, uh, a question from the audience now that's online. And this question is from uh, Yoshuke Aoki from the Japan Ministry of Defense. He says, the U.S. Navy is modernizing its naval forces under DMO. Do you think that promotion of this concept will change the way the Seventh Fleet and the Japanese Maritime Defense Force operates? We've already talked about DMO, but how do you see DMO and JMSDF? Yeah, I'll tell you that I have the, the best relationship with my counterpart with the JMSDF, Vice Admiral Yuasa. He and I were, when I was a strike group commander, he was Fleet Escort Force. We both went away for a little bit and came back. Mm -hmm. And he's Sinkisty Fleet now, and I'm Seventh Fleet. And so we, uh, we have weekly meetings where we get together uh, in our commander's update briefs. Uh, we conduct war games with uh, our counterparts in the Japan. That's another thing. I, I used a little bit of a then and now uh, description earlier, but what I didn't say, that was in a PRC lens, what I didn't say is how far Japan has come in their thinking, whether it be in the joint uh, world, uh, you know, the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force and 3MEF, and our Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force and U.S. Navy are working together every day out there uh, to share information, to uh, con conduct fires using all these different sensors. And so, uh, and, and we're bringing in the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force as well. And our Bomber Task Force can, uh, from the U.S. conducts flights in that area and we integrate with them as well. So, uh, from a DMO perspective, it's a topic of discussion that we have with Japan. They obviously have a little different geography that they have to worry about. Their nation is within the 
weapons engagement zone and they have to defend their territory. So when we look at that and when we plan, we look through a little different prism with them, but uh, with the same intent and with the same uh, ironclad resolve to defend our, our very close ally. Thanks. Uh, Mallory Shelbourne. Hi, Admiral. Mallory Shelbourne with USNI News. Um, it appears that we've been seeing uh, near monthly transits through the, through the Taiwan Strait, but it also appears that we've seen fewer freedom of navigation operations this year compared to 2021 and 2020. What are we to make of that, and how else are you doing presence operations in the region? Yeah, Mallory, I wouldn't make too much of it. Um, so we do Taiwan Strait transits on a fairly uh, regular basis, but not so regular that we're predictable. And we do the same thing with Freedom of Navigation program. That's a, a State Department run program. A lot of people don't don't recognize that, but uh, we get our uh, our direction, and we work. Department of Defense works with the uh, Department of State on which Freedom of Navigation ops we're going to do, and they're not all oriented towards the PRC. They're oriented towards any excessive claims by any country. So sometimes you may not see us doing one overtly in the South China Sea because maybe we're doing one some other part of the world. And so, uh, you know, we, we balance uh, the operations that we do both in the South China Sea as well as in the Phil Sea as well as the Freedom of Navigation or Taiwan Strait or maybe one of our allies and partners is doing one of those things so that, you know, we try to, to assess the situation, to assess our deterrence capability, and uh, we pull all of those operations and all of the the areas that we're sailing into this assessment, and, and we throttle up and throttle down based on what we're, what we're uh, seeing. Are some of them just not getting announced? Is it possible throughout the world, not just in, in your region? No, the, the FONOP program is a global program. Anywhere that uh, somebody has an excessive claim against the baseline or they re require us to notify them before we enter waters, uh, we will we'll, we'll, uh, challenge that that claim, because if you don't challenge it, then it becomes just de facto the way it is, and uh, that's the whole point of the program. That's a really good point, because uh, I think people, because of recent history, associate it with the PRC and the mm -hmm. Taiwan Strait, but I mean, I can remember doing fun-ups against Canadian claims, yeah. and uh, it's very South Park, but the bottom line is, <laughs> the bottom line is that people do tend to link those. Yeah, they do. And uh, it's just global. Um, Mallory, did you get your answer? Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I've got a question over here. Sir, uh, Silas on. I work for Planet Federal, a commercial satellite imagery provider, and also a retired uh, Navy Intel officer. Thank you, thank you for being with us today. Well, my question has to do with um, uh, artificial intelligence, technology innovation. Um, I read with interest and have been following the sail drone use out at uh, Task Force 59 out at CENTCOM. It uh, seems like they have really kind of uh, doubled down on, on that sort of technology. Disaggregated sensors, AI, uh, seems like something that would be useful for you uh, out at uh, out the Western Pacific. I want to see if you had any anything to say on, on what you think of those programs. Yeah, my good friend, my good friend Brad Cooper uh, sat next to me yesterday at the three-star, four-star, and uh, we're always kind of bantering back and forth about this. but. Uh, Without a doubt, he is learning, and with the unmanned uh, task force, we are in this very rapid evolution of understanding how to sense and make sense. And uh, I keep saying, yeah, you keep learning, and when you get it perfected, I'm going to take it. Um, but uh, no, I do think there's, there's value, and uh, you know, clearly he, I am the good recipient of, or the beneficiary of not having to send my carrier strike groups through my fleet anymore and on to CENTCOM. And so, uh, I'm keeping him in Seventh Fleet, which is exactly where I want to where I want to keep him. That, unfortunately for him, has left him with a little less capacity than he's had in the past. And so this uh, ability to use the sail drones and to work with quite wealthy countries out there and get them involved in in this uh, effort and build the maritime domain awareness has has worked quite well. I I can see application in in many areas that I um, I can't be everywhere all the time. Uh, I, so I, I do think there is a value. I, I would love to see the price points come down a little bit uh, and to be able to truly get our unmanned sensors to be uh, disposable. We're not quite at that point. And we did take his, uh, his capability and we did an exercise down in Sydney. 
uh, where we, we worked it in the Sydney Harbor with Australians so that they could see the, the capability. So we're, we're bringing it, but we're still in that learning and growing phase. And I'm quite frankly uh, happy right now to let him you know, bring all the resources there and really work the AI piece of it because I think that's the secret sauce is what he likes to say. And so once we get that figured out, I, I think that we'll see it expand uh, across the remainder of the Navy. Thank you. So let's go from sail drones to uh, Triton UAV. Got a question here from uh, the audience uh, on the Triton UAV from uh, Rich Burgess at Sea Power. He's uh, wanting to know is how are you finding that asset, its utility in theater? Yeah, so we, we obviously have been operating with Triton in theater for quite some time. Uh, we're getting close to where we're getting to the IOC level of Triton. Um, you know, we, we're going to use Triton as a replacement for some of our surveillance aircraft. And so the, the biggest benefit it brings, clearly it's got some uh, it's tremendous endurance. And so we've, we've operated it out of Guam routinely. We've started working to operate it out of various places in Japan and, and trying to not only make sure, you know, make sure we can uh, have numerous places to take off and land. Uh, I think in competition it has great benefit because of its legs. Uh, we're going to work to build up an orbit. It'll be, we'll have to, to learn our way through uh, some of the capability that an EP3 might bring back. It'll be a different way of processing the information than, than we do with our EP3s. And so we're working as a Navy to figure out how we seamlessly make that transition. Uh, but, you know, any sensor is goodness in my fleet. It's a huge AOR. And to have something that has that kind of legs and that persistence uh, really helps. That's great. Um, I've got a question from... Uh Admiral Kevin, Vice Admiral Kevin Green, USN retired. Uh, he said, do we need to develop additional regional capabilities and operating locations in, uh, in your AOR? So additional regional contingency operating locations. So we, uh, we do have programs, and I have a task force, Task Force 75, that operates out of Guam. It's my, my CBs and my... EOD uh, team, and every day they're operating in various countries. And when you get when I get their slide and their footprint, and I see all the different nations that they have teams in, uh, whether they're doing a, an EOD exercise with another nation, whether they're do, doing diving and salvaging to improve a nation's capability in that regard, or whether the CBs are constructing a schoolhouse or constructing a warehouse, uh, we are. Uh, building places, I won't say bases in places, but we're building capability and, uh, and things that we might need in a contingency. And there's a very, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific Command has a plan for where we put forces and what activities we do and what investments we make. And so uh, we are actively in the process of doing that. Got it. Uh, next up. Hi, sir. Jennifer Ladd from Defense One. I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about, as North Korea has increased some of their missile launches recently, as Admiral Daly mentioned, um, is that requiring more of Seventh Fleet's attention and resources, and how is that maybe affecting some of the resources and attention you might normally have elsewhere? Sorry. Yeah, clearly they, uh, they are on a little campaign right now of launching ballistic missiles and short-range ones, and and it certainly has all of our attention, U.S. Forces Korea, as well as mine and, and PAC fleets, and, and it's a concern. Um, you know, when, we, uh, when they launched the missiles, we pulled together uh, a, a short-notice ballistic missile defense exercise with Japan and South Korea, and that was uh, something that we were very united on. Um, the Reagan had been in the Sea of Japan. They, they uh, had done an exercise called MC SOFX, which is a counter special operating forces exercise with South Korea. And so I think that what you saw was after many years of not operating in the Sea of Japan and visiting South Korea for a couple of reasons, one COVID, another the prior administration had different, uh, different way of doing business than the current uh, South Korean administration. And so us being in that area, I think probably precipitated a little bit of uh, his tantrum, whatever you want to call it. Um, 
but uh, as far as taking away resources, we always have resources available for it. Uh, it's a concern, but not one that I'm uh, going to prioritize over my bigger concern in the area. Sure. Thank you, sir. Yep. Question over here. Good afternoon. <clears throat> um, I'm Veronica Cartier, uh, and my <clears throat> concentration is in Indo-Pacific region. Uh, I would like to get your perspective for the uh, coming uh, planning for strategic uh, indo pacom towards Indonesia. I, um, I learned that, uh, you know, the uh, U.S. Philippine um, joint exercise sama-sama perhaps is not quite suitable for Indonesia. As you may, we may learn that China has been very strong than ever spread all over Indone Indonesia, especially in the island of um, Sumatra, where in the south, where is location of the Strait Malacca. Well, China has been concentrated on that region. It means China will have control of the Strait Malacca, also the access to Indian and Pacific Oceans and Indonesian seas. So, Veronica. So, what is your perspective um, to have a previously um, American base in the, above the Java Island? It was in a, several years ago. And I think that is my opinion is the uh, strategic to control China spread and you know all over. So the um, American base bases to be back in the among Indonesian island. And I'd like to get your perspective on yeah, that. Veronica. Yeah, thanks for that question. So I, I did have a chance to go to Jakarta not too uh, long ago. Uh, I get out and get a chance to visit my counterparts and had a, a great visit with. The Admiral's down in Jakarta, and when I was there, my good friend Admiral Hammond from Australia was there at the exact same time. And so we, uh, we engaged with the leadership of Indonesia, and we talked about the concerns that they have. Uh, we have an exercise called CCAT that we do out of Singapore that talks about this very important crossroad of Indonesia and, and the activity that we're seeing down in that area. And so we, uh, we have LCS ships that are in Singapore and operate out of Singapore. And so I think that the entire region and in that Kakadu uh, uh, exercise I talked about, we had Indonesian representation there as well. And so, uh, you know, I think there is no uh, lack of concern about where the PRC uh, is trying to influence and expand uh, and, and the resources that they're trying to, uh, to gain and the, the places they're trying to gain access to. So I think many uh, nations share in your same concern and uh, in the dialogue that I have and the staff talks that I have with these nations, uh, we talk about that. Uh, they, Indonesia wasn't part of Sama Sama, but Indonesia and Malaysia and the Philippines have a very uh, tight relationship to uh, patrol the Sulu Sea and work together in that area. So Indonesia is a great partner, a great friend, and we, uh, we work closely with them in many of these exercises. Uh, one last thing is, do you think for Indonesian President uh, Widodo or Jokowi is cooperating with the U.S. request for more open of uh, American involvement in the Navy in Indonesia? Yeah, I think that Indonesia is a great partner, and I look forward to working with them. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, Thank you. Over here, Sam Legrone. I think we'll just have time for these two last questions here. All right, I'll make it quick. Uh, uh, afternoon, Admiral. Um, a lot of the conversation around the Chinese capabilities are sensitive, classified, um, depending on uh, what, what avenue you're looking at that. How much can you talk about the threat and the, the counter to the threat down on the deck plates? What are you telling your sailors? Um, you know, that are, that are on these ships doing these operations in the South China Sea? How do you articulate the threat? Uh, and, and how do you let them know what the stakes are? Thank you. Yeah, I think that we're 
You know, we, we talk a lot about how China is the pacing threat, and they certainly have uh, capability, but we talk about the importance of, of our mission, and when we're going to sail and we're going to operate, we're going to fly anywhere international law allows. And so when I'm on ships and I'm talking to the sailors, I articulate the importance of their mission first. I uh, articulate the importance of being ready. Uh, and articulate the, uh, the fact that you know, we have a responsibility as the leaders of, of uh, the navies that are out there to work with our allies, our partners, our teammates together. And to every day you're operating, uh, train like it could happen because that's our job. That's what they pay me to do. That's what they pay my, my sailors and my Navy to do, and that is to, to be ready to defend if necessary, and we are. Uh, and so I've, uh, you know, I, I try to get out as much as I can to be able to explain just exactly the behavior that we see and to tell my sailors the role that they play. Uh, and it's not just a, a U.S. role. It's you know, the role they play as ambassadors as they visit these countries. Uh, the role they play when they communicate with their teammates on other ships to, to make sure that they can uh, not only share the way they do their techniques and their tactics and their procedures, but to ensure that, it, that we're operating as one team because it's going to take uh, the entire free world coming together to enforce the rules-based international order, and, and, and it's a lot at stake. And uh, I think that our, the average sailor that's out in the Seventh Fleet understands that, that there's a tremendous amount at stake. Thanks. Um, over here for our final question. Good afternoon, Admiral. I'm uh, Lieutenant Commander Ross Hammerer. Um, recently this year, we announced that uh, we're going to send two more destroyers to Rota to be forward uh, deployed there. Uh, you mentioned earlier as well uh, Force Design 2030 and the work that you do with 3MEF. Uh, do you see or do you feel that uh, one ARG forward deployed to your fleet is enough, or do you see that there's an increased need in order to support Force Design uh, 2030 with more uh, amphibious ships forward deployed uh, to 7th Fleet? Thanks, sir. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I think that uh, presence matters first and foremost. So uh, the more ships that we have forward, the more opportunities we have to, to use them. I think that uh, our goal right now is about having a constant 1-0 presence of the ARG. That would be the the level that would be good for competition. Clearly, we can surge more if we need. Uh, we have the America ARG that is for deployed, so she's out and available half the year. And then what we try to do is deploy an ARG uh, to cover down for the remainder of the year from the West Coast. And if we can maintain that, that gives us that constant presence that uh, is a good deterrence baseline. And then clearly, we have forces that can surge uh, if, if we see the need to as we assess what's happening in the theater. Uh, we have a balance uh, of having Marines on amphibious ships because they are our crisis response force. If something happens, we can immediately get them there and quell something. And then we all know the force design effort and being uh, thin and being able to be nimble and sense and be able to provide fires on off access. And that capability is extremely important if we were to get into a high-end fight. And so being able to work across that spectrum and being able to train to it uh, as long as we have a, at least one uh, amphibious readiness group out there that can either work ashore like they're doing right now from Cockadoo up to Resolute Dragon or to be on the ships and work uh, with my maritime ships. It's uh, the ability to flex and to be able to move, maneuver and, and adjust. That's the versatility that you have in the U.S. Navy. That's the versatility you have in the naval team. And uh, that's on display every day out in the Seventh Fleet. Thanks, sir. One saved round, one minute on the Coast Guard forward with the uh, National Security Cutters, Peter Ange and others have asked this question. Their contribution and with the nature of ops, do you want more of that? Absolutely. Uh, I think I think with what we mentioned with the, the gray zone, you can't have enough Coast Guard forward. And uh, they've, they've been great partners and they've been uh, pushing as much forward as they can. I think that it's a capacity issue and... and uh, right. But, but the right tool right for your tool job. For it. Exactly. Well, I just uh, can't thank you enough for uh, making time. We know your time is precious. It's a really, uh, it's really exciting to get you here in person with our audience and online. And on behalf of CSIS and the Naval Institute, Admiral, we just want to thank you uh, for giving us this time. And uh, also want to thank our sponsor, 
HII, without whom we wouldn't be able to uh, continue this uh, wonderful maritime security dialogue series. We thank you. And uh, let's give the Admiral a big hand. Okay, I think we're out. Uh, I, I think uh, this was wonderful and really appreciate your time again. And I uh, hope you could take a few minutes and just look around the Naval Institute for 10 minutes. Absolutely. Thanks for That'd having me. That would be great. Thank you. Thanks again. Yeah.